Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Jane Beeman. Uh, I'm the Director of Clinical and Scientific Affairs here at Euclid Systems Corporation. And I wanna start by thanking you for taking your valuable time uh, to spend with us tonight. Tonight is the inauguration of our 2021 webinar series. And I'm very, very pleased on tonight's topic as I believe it is the kind of tips and information that we can all take back to practice on uh, tomorrow morning and begin to find them and utilize them. So first, for those of you who are not wholly familiar with Euclid and our, um, the way we do our webinars, let me first tell you that this webinar from the, the introduction on is strictly the opinions of, uh, of Dr. Kading. You know, it may not be uh, the Euclid uh, point of view or our FDA definition for our products. Now, tonight's speaker is someone that's familiar to many of us. I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Kading for quite a few years now. So Dr. Kading has been recognized by his peers as one of the top 50 most influential optometrists of all time. He's a top innovator in eye care and in 2017, was actually listed as one of the top 10 eye care practices. He's very progressive and forward thinking in the way he approaches healthcare and technology in his practice. And that brings us a lot of new and fresh perspective. He consults with companies like Euclid and other healthcare and technology around the world to help them see what the future of practitioner eye care can bring. Dr. Kading completed his specialty training in custom contact lenses and corneal disease. He now hosts a fellowship program on dry eyes and specialty contact lenses at his uh, three office locations in the Seattle, Washington uh, metro area. He's written over a hundred articles in paper and given hundreds of lectures internationally. Um, I cannot thank him enough for taking time uh, tonight uh, to give us a little bit of information on the success of orthokeratology and myopia management in his practice. So Dr. Katie, thank you. Well, thank you, Jane. Uh, certainly a, a pleasure here to be with you in 2020 plus one. That's how we're going to refer to it so that it's a uh, a little better than last year. Um, I'm excited to start the year uh, just a couple days in uh, with the opportunity to talk about myopia management and why now is the time that we need to be getting our patients into this. I had an opportunity to look through the attendee list and uh, many of you know more about myopia management than I do, but I think each of us has a little different perspective that we can have uh, with regards to this. And some of you may be brand new to myopia management and uh, don't do it at all in your practice. And uh, so what I'm hoping to do today is to be able to present some specific insights into myopia management and why right now is the time for us to be doing myopia management or more myopia management in your practice. Um, additionally, some insights into maybe how to be a little more successful with myopia management in your practice and uh, possibly some of the things that we can say and, uh, and talk with parents and the patient uh, about with regards to myopia management and why it's so critical for us. Um, this presentation is uh, usually a, a, a COPE approved lecture um, and for that reason, I always like to disclose that, uh, you know, I have no financial interest in any of the products that I'd mentioned, although uh, Euclid is generously supporting this opportunity for us to meet together. Uh, I'll be talking about other products as well and other things with regards to myopia management. We are at the cusp of myopia management. Although uh, several of us on the call have been, uh, have been doing myopia management, in my case for 15 years, uh, it just seems to now be exploding. It was kind of, uh, kind of this workup and now we're at the precipice and now we're needing to uh, really be going. So uh, myopia is certainly something we need to be thinking about, uh, especially 
uh, with COVID and this other pandemic going on. The myopia pandemic is is very rampant and uh, it is affecting people worldwide as any pandemic does. <clears throat> but COVID has a unique place with regards to how we need to be thinking about myopia for our patients, of which I will speak about uh, a little bit later. Uh, but first, how is COVID affecting us? And, you know, we, we can look at these statistics. I looked at divorce rates. I looked at uh, how, you know, there's about 24 to 44% less people getting married uh, than normally would be. We see here personal care, like uh, haircuts and nail salons. Uh, the personal spending is reduced substantially. And, uh, you know, we're seeing that in our offices, you know, practice wide. Uh, my practice was down last year, and many of you were as well. We had one of the best uh, third quarters that we've ever had, uh, but certainly the impact with that second quarter really hit most of us. Average monthly online spending has increased, and so that's driving people to do things uh, as far as where they're spending their money in kind of a different way. Uh, we see personal care, things like, uh, like as I said, haircuts and nail salons, as well as uh, uh, gyms being closed and so forth. Uh, substantial percentage of businesses around the world are closing. Uh, somewhere around five to 600 uh, small businesses were closing every day uh, in uh, March through August. Um, and so people are just uh, in uh, you know, the dire straits with regards to the pandemic, um, even though not a whole lot of people percentage wise uh, got the condition, it altered, as we all know, so many of our behaviors. And, you know, we, we get asked that question all the time. Well, you know, is now the right time for us to be incorporating this new treatment? Uh, in no less of a case than somebody coming in with some other chronic disease, would we want to start uh, looking at treating them? You know, the doctor, is right now the right time for me to be treating my glaucoma? You know, is, is, is this the right time to be diagnosed? Uh, yeah, yeah, we got to take care of this before it becomes out of control. We know that 100 million people are affected with myopia around the world. Singapore has somewhere around 75% of its population with myopia. Places like Hong Kong, as high as 80%. And in Korea, 97% of the population having, uh, having myopia. We know in, uh, in places like China, 90% of some Chinese students uh, complete schooling with a nearsighted refractive error. I just got a kick out of, uh, out of seeing some of the things that are being done as a public health effort um, in understanding the myopic disease of taking breaks specifically to do eye exercises and having these bars built into the desks for uh, Harman distance uh, type of reading and so forth to keep you so you don't get too close uh, when you're doing your schoolwork and then natural lighting in an effort to try to reduce some of the issues. And then we know that this, this problem that we're encountering right now is, uh, is really not the big issue. The big issue is going to be years down the road uh, we're going to be seeing some exponential growth of myopia as it is, but even more importantly, the number of patients who have high myopia. Genetically, we know that if both of your parents are myopic, you're six times greater risk of developing myopia. So, you know, those parents that are coming in with young children who are emetropes, and I ask them, you know, about their uh, personal refractive error, that that brings up the question of how we may need to watch this person a little bit closer. Another thing that is of importance is to look at, uh, you know, how the person, how the child uh, is occupying their day. You know, there were days during kind of these shutdowns where I just noticed that uh, myself and my kids, we didn't go outside much. You know, we tried to get outside every day to try to get a little fresh air at least. And, you know, uh, but during this pandemic, especially, uh, we did not see the light of day nearly the way that we have in years past. And, uh, you know, the hope is that that doesn't set up new patterns 
and new habits for people to living their life even further indoors. We were intended to be outdoor people, and we really need to be spending hours every day outside. For an adult, that's you know really difficult, uh, but for children, it certainly is so very, very important. Uh, and then the greater risk factor, the younger the patient becomes myopic. And this is really something that starts to hit home a little bit as we are seeing children in our practice. You know, I've seen many practices around the country who say, well, we don't see children under the ages of seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, right? You know, we really want to feel comfortable that this is you know, a patient who can, uh, can benefit from our care and we can't help those younger children. Well, you know, quite frankly, our, these younger children are not going to be fighter pilots. And if their vision is not super, super the crisp the same way, but if we are detecting pathology or detecting disease or detecting accommodative issues, those are really the things that we are looking at helping these kids with. So I implore upon you that if you don't see pediatrics under the age of six years old, now's the time to start. Become comfortable finding what, what you know, you know the, the whole 21 point exam that OEP put out years ago might not be what you do on a five-year-old, uh, but becoming comfortable with your retinoscopy, becoming comfortable with using cycloplegic drops, and then even your uh, autorefractor is a critical component, particularly with uh, myopia management. And then, you know, and my, my wife is a pediatric optometrist, so she feels far more comfortable with this than I do, uh, but I still see pediatric patients and, uh, you know, try to become as comfortable as I possibly can with them. If a child develops any measure, any measure of myopia before they are six or seven years old, they have a six to seven times greater risk of developing high myopia as an adult. That is such a critical number. You know, I hear patients all the time, or I hear practitioners all the time ask, well, you know, I have a, a kid who's seven years old and he's only minus a half. So we're going to wait a little while and see what happens. Uh, well, the writing's on the wall. If you become myopic at that early age, uh, you are on a road somewhere and it is not a good road. You need to be uh, taking a U-turn and going backwards as much as you can and seeing if you can stop this progression. When do we worry? Well, we worry that if somebody is emetropic before the age of six, seven, or eight, uh, that becomes a little cumbersome in our practice, particularly if they have risk factors. If an, uh, uh, an eight-year-old is an emetrope and both of their parents are myopes, we start to watch them a little closer. Now, certainly they're less likely to really become myopic if they're eight years old and still an emetrope. But if they are six or five years old and they're an emetrope, there's a good chance that they are going to convert over to becoming a, a minus a quarter or a minus a half in the next year or two and still falling into that six to seven, eight year range of if they're a myope, six times, 6.6 6 times greater risk of developing high myopia. So really, really want to monitor that six to eight year mark. And if there's any myopia, you know that you're really needing to start taking things into consideration. Most people consider a half a diopter of correction to be progression in myopia. I don't. I consider a quarter of a diopter to be progression in my practice. And for that reason, we monitor these patients very, very closely. Uh, if you don't do a cycloplegic refraction, I implore you to consider doing so. Um, you can do it uh, with cyclopenylate, which is the most ideal scenario, and then wait 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and if that's just not going to work for your practice, then you could use tropicamide. But the, the key area of the most cycloplegic component with tropicamide 
is a narrower window. And so you want to make sure that you're not leaving this patient for 35 minutes dilating as you might accidentally do with a glaucoma patient. You need to be in there right away uh, when that max cycloplegic takes effect. So I remember when I was in optometry school, I was a minus one, minus one and a quarter. And uh, I recall having, having you know, some of the, the professors tell me, you know, you have the perfect refractive air. Uh, this is going to be the one that is the, you know, the best thing for you. And it brings up the question of what is the perfect refractive air? You know, many people have said, you know, a minus one to a minus two is really not a bad place to be because uh, you're going to have that correction for accommodative issues as you uh, get older. Other people call it presbyopia, but now that I'm having accommodative issues, we'll just call it accommodative issues instead of presbyopia. Uh, so that complex interaction really brings out some, some interesting things. And Flickcroft did some great work on the risk factors with each things. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, I love this paper. Uh, this was done and, and published by, uh, by Mark and Noel. And uh, what they did is they looked at five large scale studies of, of over 21,000 patients. And they looked at the studies to look at you know, what happens when people become myopic and what happens to these higher myopes and, uh, and so forth. And as people progress in their myopia, what's going to happen? And the conclusion is just in that last sentence there that I've written is they demonstrated that slowing myopia by one diopter lowers the risk of myopic maculopathy, which is quite possibly the worst pathology we have. Anything that affects the macula for our vision, you know, if you don't know, if you don't have macular degeneration, none of us can really appreciate what that is. But if you don't have macular uh, degeneration, it's difficult for us to know, but it is by far the worst retinal pathology. Um, if we can slower thing, low thing, lower things down by one diopter, uh, it slows macular, macular myopathy, uh, myopic maculopathy by 40%. And this is the interesting component, regardless of the refractive error of that child. So this is true for a one to two diopter myope. This is true for an emetrope to a minus one myope. Regardless of the refractive error that the patient has, if you can keep them from progressing by even one diopter, you're reducing the risk by 40%. Now that's huge, right? And if it's two diopters and you can keep them from that, then it's that exponential component. Very interesting data here to really point to one diopter makes all the difference in the world. Now, you know, when people talk, talk to me about being the perfect refractive error of a minus one to a minus two, uh, you know, I, I thought I could get on board with that. But then we look at the risk factors here. You know, when I tell a patient, oh, it's okay if you become progressive in your myopia, as long as it doesn't get too high, you're fine. What I'm telling them is I'm telling them it's okay that we allow your relative risk of developing glaucoma to double or to triple. We're gonna take your relative risk of developing a retinal detachment and we're gonna increase it by three times. Uh, that's okay. By me saying I'm an advocate for you progressing in your myopia a little bit, as long as it doesn't get too high, I'm still advocating for you to get glaucoma or risk factors of getting glaucoma, retinal detachments or myopic maculopathy. I don't think any of us would wanna be on board with that and have that written in our chart that we're advocating for that. But that's what we're doing when we don't really push to slow down every patient by every diopter. Now, I think we can all get on board with, we'd like to keep patients from becoming high myopes, right? We look at these relative risk factors for retinal detachment uh, for, a minus, uh, for a minus seven being 44 times the odds ratio and 126 odds ratio for 
developing myopic maculopathy. And none of us would get on board with that. But where we have to be is we have to despise one diopter if we're going to despise seven for the very purpose of we have to be against glaucoma, retinal detachment, and myopic maculopathy in all intensive forms. So where we need to be is we need to be at a place where we can say myopia is a disease. If you can't get on board with that, then you will not be overly successful in your myopia management practice. If you cannot despise myopia, you cannot be overtly super successful with it. You have to understand that myopia is on the rise. We can slow it down. Myopia management is not difficult uh, and failure just quite frankly is not an option. If what you're doing on a patient is not slowing it down as much as you want it to, you need to try something else. Uh, quite frankly, if these things are not believed by you, then quite frankly, you likely will not be super successful in your myopia management practice. So can we prove that we can slow it down? Yeah, we can. We got plenty of data to support that. Various different things have been looked at over the years from atropine to spectacles, ortho K, soft contact lenses, RGPs, soft contact lenses. Do those things really work? Well, a couple of tidbits here of things that we're not as big of fans of. Number one is doing nothing. Uh, and by doing nothing, I mean not advocating for children to come in for an eye exam every six months to a year. Uh, I recall when I was in Alaska and I was seeing patients up there and, uh, you know, they were telling me I do not want a new prescription because when you gave us a new prescription last time, we advanced. And so every time you do that, it just makes my eyes get worse and I don't want them to get any worse. So I'm going to take a lower prescription. And at the time, you know, I wasn't aware of the studies that said that if we undercorrect our patients, they're likely to advance faster than if we correct them at their normal amount. So undercorrection is out. You must advocate against that in all intensive forms and tell people uh, that there is research out there. And if you need that data, let us know. Uh, but plenty of data proving that undercorrecting is going to cause progression to happen faster. And then there's RGPs. And RGPs have been thought to slow down the progression of myopia. I was taught that. Many of you were taught that as well. Uh, the reality is that RGPs alone do not slow down the progression. We know that once they, a patient is removed from RGP lens wear, their cornea and refractive air goes to a normal level of which it may, must be unless that lens is designed to cause a, uh, a peripheral retinal change. And we can do that with orthokeratology. So let's speak about a couple of these uh, in a little more clarity. So spectacle lenses, you know, we've got work being done even now on spectacle lenses. We've got lenses with ads built into them, which is the most common way, but there's also lenses that are, have different color filters or polarization in different ways that are being looked at. We took part in a study uh, on spectacle lenses from myopia management. I think it was probably about seven years ago. Uh, that lens is not on the market yet, uh, but could be in the future. The data on spectacle lenses is really variable from a bifocal perspective based upon how that bifocal is put into place. So I hear practitioners tell me, you know, I, I, I do myopia management. I prescribe bifocals to my patients. And I kind of ask, well, how do you decide what bifocal to use and how to go about this? And uh, <clears throat> the reality is they don't know. Uh, adding a bifocal to a patient does not slow down their progression of myopia unless it's done for somebody who potentially has an accommodative issue or something of the like. And uh, then you may be able to get something from a three time, uh, a 3% in decrease to a 20%. But the reality is I don't think that's enough for most people to notice the difference. Uh, 
Here's a lens, this is called the DIMS lens, the DeFocus Incorporated Multiple Segment Design. And if you can kind of look at that lens in the right way, this isn't a reflection, this is different refractive corrective lenses with the, uh, different powers built into that lens. There's a couple companies that are utilizing a lens like this internationally. This is one of my patients who, uh, who was referred to see me from Hong Kong uh, and came over and came to my practice um, and is utilizing a uh, preservative free, ready available 0.01% atropine that they have over in Asia. Um, and then they were also using the DIMS lens. This particular patient had no slowing of her myopia over the last couple of years. Uh, she had a large astigmatic correction. And uh, for that reason was told that she couldn't wear any contact lens option while her brother was doing orthokeratology. Incidentally, we fit her into a, uh, a toric emerald lens and uh, she's doing just great, loving orthokeratology and the mother is wondering why they didn't do it sooner. Um, so this lens here is uh, made by Hoya. As you can see, it's got these little segments with point, uh, plus 3.5 myopic to focus in it. And then there's a central zone for distance refractive correction built into this. So we don't have it available in the United States, but who knows? We'll see. Soft multifocals have been used for years and you can see the variability depending on the study that is looked at here. Now, uh, one of the things with regards to soft multifocals is there's so much variability when you fit a patient into a soft multifocal of whether you're using a distant center, a near center, whether you're using a, a low ad or a high ad, or you're using a, a distance and a near and different eyes. Uh, is this for accommodative children or non-accommodative children? And that's the reason why we have this huge variability. And there's not as much argument, or there has been argument over the years of whether this is an approved or a really reasonable way of going. We use soft multifocals in our practice. It accounts for probably about 18 to 22 percent of the myopia management that we do. So not a huge component, but still substantial enough that uh, you know we focus in on it. Uh, there is available options uh, like my site that is uh, now available in the United States. Excuse me for not correcting that on the slide yet. It is available in the United States. Um, and uh, Natreview is a lens that is not approved by the FDA, but has been historically used by many practitioners, including my practice over the years for the correction. Um, also, we have toric lenses available with uh, Biofinity and ProClear, these types of lenses. Have, uh, have, have been available and are now something that we can be thinking about for our patients. And there's many others. I, I'm not adding everything together, but those are the most commonly used ones here in the United States. And uh, <clears throat> with regards to what, what ad power, uh, you know, we, we for years, and I, I come out of the, the School of Thought of Pacific University is, our perspective was use the highest ad power in order to manipulate that peripheral to focus. And we were doing that somewhat anecdotally, uh, you know, somewhat based upon what we believe to be the case in the earlier years. And just recently, the Blink study uh, last year uh, was published on the effects of high ad versus medium ad versus single vision lenses for myopic progression. And in this particular study, utilizing a 2.5 ad power compared to a 1.5 compared to a single vision, the higher refractive air uh, slowed the, uh, the higher ad power, pardon me, uh, slowed the progression the most and was uh, by far the better option. And so uh, that backed up what we had always thought. We had been utilizing lenses that were plus three or even higher in some patients, um, and they did very, very well with them. And we know that to be the case uh, with my site as well, which is you know the most recent lens launched here into the United States, um, is doing very well. Uh, one of the things that I have to tip my hat to with regards to CooperVision 
is, uh, is the program that they've built around this to help practitioners who haven't done myopia management to start getting more involved into it. And certainly uh, a fan of anything we can do to raise all of the ship. 60% reduction uh, in the cycloplegic spherical equivalent, 52% reduction in axial length in this particular study. And as I had mentioned before, Natribu's lens has been available for quite a while, not FDA approved. There have been some studies on myopia management, uh, but not my FDA approved for myopia management, approved for the correction of uh, myopia and nearsightedness. Uh, but the, the one of the things that we like about this lens is its availability up to a minus 12. It's a daily disposable. Uh, there's one ad power like the MySight lens, uh, not available in Toric as neither is the MySight lens. You would need to go to a monthly disposable, which there are a couple. Now, I don't want to speak too much about atropine, um, but uh, atropine is a, is a huge part of our practice. Uh, and I'll speak to that a little bit more later. But uh, if you're not doing atropine in your practice, I would highly encourage you to figure out a place within your local market where you can get it. We have a compounding pharmacy that we can have send the, the prescription to the patient here in Washington state. And uh, we just send the prescription over, connect the patient with the pharmacy, and uh, we go from there. And we're able even to do a preservative free option for the patient, which is really, really nice. And so each part of the country kind of has a different way of doing that. But then the question comes up as to what concentration to use. And the LAMP study made it very, very clear. This was published in 2019, made it clear to us that if we're going to be prescribing the higher the concentration, the better. Now, there was the ADAM study that was published and the perspective from the ADAM study is that if you go too high with the concentration, that when the patient stops using the drop, that they'll have a huge rebound effect. And just like uh, a perspective around steroids with a patient with uveitis is if you go strong with the steroid and then all of a sudden you stop, there may be a rebound effect well, instead, you need to taper. And people who had been utilizing uh, atropine for years and years and years told us, well, why would you ever stop suddenly? No, you would need to taper that patient down. And so they knew that. We didn't know that you know, in those early years of Adam. Um, and so the LAMP study showed us that the higher concentration is better and then if the patient decides that they want to stop taking it, you could either lower the concentration down to 0 0.1, uh, or it probably is a low enough concentration at 0 0.5 uh, that the patient's fine. Where we start with atropine is we start at 0.5% in all of our patients, and uh, then we just warn them about potential side effects, would be, which would be accommodative issues, which would potentially be some issues with pupil dilation. Uh, that's so few and far between, has happened. I'm not gonna say it hasn't, but so few and far between that we just go to the highest concentration right off the bat because of its beneficial effect for our patients. And, uh, you know, really the bread and butter of, of my practice is orthokeratology. Just recently, I had an opportunity to uh, read a paper that my resident is putting together. And uh, what she's done is uh, she's brand new to, to optometry. I mean, she just graduated optometry school. She's brand new to contact lens fitting. Uh, she has me as a mentor, but, you know, how good is that really? Uh, but she uh, sees the vast majority of her patients on her own, comes to me with any questions that she might have. And uh, I said, I just want to know the data for, you know, the first however many patients you've seen over a time period. So she took the first 30 patients that she had seen. And uh, what's really interesting is it, uh, is, is it basically took her uh, less than three visits to get from start to finalized lens. And it took her uh, on average, um, I, I believe it was uh, one 
0.17 lens changes. And so the vast majority of people didn't need a lens change. 80% apparently didn't need a lens change at all. And then a small percentage did, and she was able to get the vast majority, almost everybody solved within 2.67 visits, I think it was. So if you're new to orthokeratology, your data could be the exact same as hers. She's a neophyte contact lens fitter um, and has done an amazing job with adapting into it. So orthokeratology has carried incredible data uh, and consistent data. You look at almost every study. I mean, I, I can't think of one that's really low uh, or much lower than 40%. And the data tends to be in the 50 to 60% range of the slowing down of myopia. And uh, largely the reason why we think of that is uh, because of the way that the peripheral defocus is. Now, if we take a regular standard myopic corrective lens, uh, we get clarity at the macula. But because of the asphericity of that lens, we tend to not get a perfect peripheral clarity. In order to do that, we would need more plus in the periphery and most spectacle lenses and potentially uh, some soft contact lenses may in fact yield more myopia in the periphery of the lens, in which case we would be doing the exact opposite of what we want to do, which is this. And that's what orthokeratology does. That's why uh, distance center lenses with a near periphery for a soft lens is going to bring about that peripheral defocus that is what we're really looking for uh, to drive the image cell. Now, if you're not doing myopia management currently uh, with orthokeratology, there's really three types of uh, main types of orthokeratology that you uh, may choose to get into something along a, uh, a diagnostic fitting set. Um, that's where I started. Uh, and that's something along the lines that's most popularized by Paragon. Uh, you could do a topography driven, where if your topographer is set up with software, uh, you can then be driven to the direction that you wanna go uh, with the lens and the topography pretty much is just telling you what to do. You're answering questions that the topography system asks you and it drives you towards that lens that you're gonna be fitting. And then there is the empirical fitting, uh, which if you're on this because you know of Emerald, you know that that's the system that the Emerald system is. Now I was originally a fitter. Um, I used the diagnostic fitting set on my patients. Uh, I loved the fact that for a good percentage of my patients, I could go to the fitting set, pull out a lens, and it would work most of the time. Uh, not always. Uh, but what I found over the years is that I never had the lens that I needed. Um, and I was always searching for, uh, you know, making sure that I didn't do a very good job of replacing all those lenses that were in there. And uh, I had a friend who, uh, uh, by the name of Tim Cook, who told me, hey, you ought to try this different system of uh, prescribing orthokeratology lenses. And I'm like, Tim, what do, you, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, really all you need is a couple measurements and you're going to be successful. And I said, I don't really think so. I think, I think you need to fit these lenses. And he's like, well, give it a try. See what you think. You know, uh, there's times where Euclid would uh, give new fitters a, a free lens or something like that. And so I said, well, I'll give it a try on somebody. And uh, my data has been very similar to this particular research study that was published called the SMART study. This came out, I believe, in 2016. Uh, 2015, 2016 was when it was published. And what they did is they took a, a large group of uh, patients, I believe it was like 30, 300 patients. I believe there was uh, 10 different sites that were doing the study. And I think eight of the 10 had never used this particular lens design before. And what they did is they compared over three years whether the practitioners were successful with soft lenses versus ortho -K, And they found that the progression of the refractive error was substantially different. A diopter progression with soft contact lenses versus 0.13 diopters correction with the orthokeratology lens. But although that's really cool and it's really neat to see, there's some hidden things in this study 
that help new ortho K wearers, or, excuse me, new ortho K fitters and establish fitters that are doing things the way I'd always done have to start and really think about like, what are you, why are you doing things the way you are? And is there a more simplified way of doing this? And one of the things was that initial lens success was over 80%, meaning I placed the first two lenses on the eyes and I was successful with 80% accuracy right off the bat. Um, now, after a lens change, 95% success and 99% success if they needed a second lens change. Now, if you're a contact lens fitter, I'd venture to say that you're not that successful with your multifocal lenses that you use. Most all of us have to add at least one more uh, soft multifocal lens uh, on a patient. It's pretty rare that we are 80% successful with our first one. So then I had a group of people saying, no, 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 Dave, I don't believe that. No, those numbers, because, uh, you know, when I have a patient come in, they don't have a crisp 2020, 2015. Um, and for that reason, I'm not successful with my ortho K lenses. Well, in this study, their target was 2025 plus. And um, I don't know about you, but I don't know of any uh, children who are eight years old or seven years old that are snipers or that are fighter pilots that require 2015 or 2010 vision. And I'm gonna speak to that here in a moment, uh, but the vision is a really big component of this. And I asked the question to a lot of these practitioners because I dealt with this myself is, What's your primary objective with myopia management? Is it super crisp, clear vision? Or is it a solid myopia management correction? I'll speak about that in a little bit. So the simplicity with this particular method um, in an empirical fitting system, which in this case is, is what Euclid uses, and this is why they asked me to talk about it, because I, I use that lens as my primary design, not the only design, but primary design is, it's pretty simplified. All you need is the Ks, the Rx, and the HVID for the patient. And, uh, you know, it's brought about a lot of improved success. Now, I've been doing orthokeratology and myopia management in a lot of different ways over the last 15 years. And I feel like we've kind of hit the sweet spot in the last five. So what I want to do with you at this point is share with you five quick tips that uh, have helped me become more successful in my ortho K practice um, in how we've grown it substantially every year, but especially in the last five years. And the first one is what we're back, we were just talking about is know your number one goal. Why are you doing myopia management on this child? Uh, so often I have children who come in who are 2050 and the parent is surprised that they can't see. And then what I used to find is that I was changing lens after lens after lens because the child missed one letter on the 2020 line and the parent was just adamant. Hey, they got to see better. They got to see better. Meanwhile, this is the same kid whose parent didn't know that they were 2050 two weeks ago. So what's your number one goal? Is your target perfection in the vision? We know with ortho K, if a child sleeps on their eye wrong, if they don't wear their lens every day, if uh, various different things like that happen, they may not get the correction that we are really looking for. And so for that reason, we don't always expect perfect 2020 vision. What we're looking for is a centered treatment zone and 2025 plus vision. <clears throat> if we need to, for one reason or another, correct any additional refractive error, we will use spectacle lenses. And we have that conversation with parents at the front. As we say, here's the deal. And I know my good friend Gary Gerber says the same thing. He and I've had this conversation is uh, we know that these lenses will help slow the progression of your child's vision. And we're going to fit them with these lenses. And uh, you know, we hope that we're able to slow them down really, really well. One of the side effects of these lenses is that they do help correct the prescription of your patient almost all the way, not all the way, but almost all the way. 
And if we need to, we will have your child wear spectacle lenses to correct any additional power that comes up or is not corrected by the lenses. But I make sure they know that our number one objective is to slow the progression of myopia. Number two is find success early. We know that there's a six times greater risk if we wait until they become progressive. So if a child is a minus a half, fit them, do myopia management. There's three different great things you can do right now. Uh, atropine, soft multifocals, orthokeratology. Um, our go-to is typically atropine in the very, very low amounts. Um, but you know, any of the options are good options for you to consider. There's arguments of why soft multivocals or orthokeratology could be better with certain patients. That's maybe outside the realm of this whole lecture, uh, but get involved and do something. Number three is shoot for a smaller optic zone if you're doing orthokeratology. My good friend, Randy Kojima and the team at Pacific University published a great poster that was talking about this. And what I want to direct you to here is I want to direct you to the ad power that's at the bottom of this topographer. As you see on the left-hand side of your screen, the larger treatment zone. And that treatment zone extends to the pupil. And so the difference within the pupil of the most corrected area and the least corrected area in this case is a plus one. The patient with the smaller treatment zone the distance between the lowest and the, the most correction or the least and the most correction is a two and a half, in which case there's a two and a half diopter add in this particular patient. So a smaller treatment zone is better for a child doing orthokeratology, but it may give them more halos or glare, whereas a larger treatment zone is going to be greater or be more beneficial maybe to an adult wearing orthokeratology. So don't think that the bigger treatment zone is better. And to that end, uh, I do want to mention that if you, you don't have, ortho, uh, you don't have uh, a topographer when you're doing orthokeratology, that's okay. Um, I recommend it. I think that it is uh, a better way to move forward. And uh, we just justified getting a new topographer recently. Um, and that was because our ortho K practice, our myopia management practice continued to help pay for that type of device. Um, and it helps us get to our end point, hopefully uh, sooner. Um, but if you're considering getting a topographer in the next six months, um, I want to I want to have you email me and I want to talk with you about some different options. I have, I think, three or four different topographers in my practices. Um, and there's kind of a newer one that I want to introduce you to if it's something you're looking into. So you can email me. Uh, my email will be at the end of this lecture. And I kind of want to make an introduction about this new design and, and why I like it and why it's been beneficial for my practice. Number four, full correction is not needed for number one. Uh, Pauline Chu uh, and, uh, came out with a study that looked at high myopia and partial reduction. You know, I made this argument that if our goal is to slow down the progression of myopia, you do not have to have full correction in order to get there. In fact, uh, working with you know, one of my mentors, you know, the great Bruce Williams, who's a fantastic orthokeratology practitioner here in Seattle. Um, you know, we were, he, when I was working with him, he, you know, he was correcting people that were minus seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, you know, and these people didn't get full correction all day. And oftentimes they were having to wear soft contact lenses or other types of correction. And we still did that correction on those patients because, uh, Pauline's evidence is that even if we can give partial correction and then correct them with a pair of glasses, we can still slow down the progression of their myopia. And fifth is that combination treatment is A-OK. -okay. Atropine and orthokeratology combined together uh, is coming up with further and further evidence. There was just a meta-analysis that was done that my, uh, you know, I got to give credit to my resident for finding this paper, but just published that was talking about the beneficial effect of using the combination treatment that it slowed things down more than atropine or 
orthokeratology individually. This particular study here was published in 2018 and it showed a 2.6 times less progression than with atropine alone uh, when you used dual therapy and a two, per, two times less progression than orthokeratology alone. So doing multiple things may be the better option for you when it comes to doing your treatment. So uh, with that, I want to uh, take a pause here. And uh, Jane, I'm, uh, I'm guessing we may have had a couple of questions come in throughout here. And I want to see if you'll come back on and take yourself off mute and hang out with me for a little bit. I would love to, Dave. You got to the end and I had to look at the clock. I'm like, are we already finished? I was taking notes like crazy. You know, most of you know, you know, before I came on board with Euclid a few years ago, I had spent the previous 15 years in a big specialty practice. So, you know, I still am learning things every day that I can take back. I do have quite a few questions and, and they're really good ones, Dave. So I'm looking forward to this. So I, you may have answered this, but I don't want to go back to it because he asked this early. Uh, someone said, okay, I got a nine-year-old kid who is a plus a quarter. Mm. So how do I go about preventing myopia? Do I just tell them to go outside more, to get off the computer or phone, or where? where what's my first step in that scenario? Yeah, well, uh, I'm 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 glad you're thinking about that particular patient, and that's uh, that's the first start is to be worried about those uh, six, seven, eight year olds who are emetropes. So, by all intensive measures. The, the risk of high myopia for the, your patient at nine at a plus a quarter is not as high. And so because of those risk factors, I would place that patient in a low risk category and somebody I just watch every year. I personally would not put them into the category of somebody that needs to be seen every six months because they're on the track of emetropization. And so likely, and you know, there may be some people that disagree with me, but likely that patient may or will not progress into myopia uh, by all intensive measures. Now, if they do, I'd slip them right into orthokeratology or atropine or myopia, soft multifocals, fairly quickly at a minus a quarter, even if they're a minus 10. Um, and even doing some occasional treatment with wearing a soft multifocal from time to time, maybe not every single day, uh, if, if that's what they want would be the way to go. But I congratulate you on thinking about that particular patient, but from a risk factor, they're not at a high risk. So you nailed it when you mentioned that those things, Jane, is the risks of, uh, of progression into myopia go way up if you spend less time, less than two hours outside every single day. I mean, if we can get a kid to spend an hour outside every single day would be a win, but two hours is really what we're shooting for. And then I would watch their accommodative issues because that would signal whether they really need to be spending less time on digital devices and so forth. Uh, but yeah, certainly um, the 2020 rule, looking into the distance and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been interesting. I've heard so much conversation during the past 12 months, of course, is because now our children, most of them are being homeschooled, uh, you know, yeah. even or in a hybrid program, but their time on a screen is greatly increased. It They're is. not sitting in a classroom in the back row looking <clears throat> forward at a whiteboard. They're sitting at their desk or the kitchen table with a screen in front of them. So yeah. there's a lot of speculation as, you know, we, mm -hmm. we already had this rapid rise in myopia expected. Do you yeah. think the, the, the current situation is going to increase that? Yeah, that absolutely. Expected growth? I don't see any way around it. Um, we are not getting our distance activities the way that we were before the pandemic. So the myopia pandemic is going to be launched because of the COVID pandemic. And I really think that's because we've introduced ways of doing things digitally 
that have never been done to the degree that we are doing them now. I mean, kids were on the computer and were on devices before, but now kids are on the computer all day for, for school. And then the parents who are working from home can't handle the kids running around the house. And so they hand them a digital device. Um, I've seen that time and time again with my patients. And I just tell them, hey, here's the scoop. You're, if your kid is going to school at home, they cannot use a digital device in any shape or form when they are done with school. You got to kick them outside the house, get them outside, let them go play in the rain. That's what they're doing here. Um, and, uh, you know, they're like a duck. They'll be fine once they come in from the rain. But really, I, I do think that we are on a miss for it. And some of our colleagues are going to be collecting that data over the next five years. But I can almost guarantee you that the rise in, in myopia will be catapulted by this 2020 year. Yeah, I think back a couple of years ago, you know, the data that came out of the, uh, the Brian Holden Institute that talked about on that trajectory then, it would be 5 billion people would be myopic by 2050. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking COVID has shot that. I don't know what that might be. Maybe it'll be 8 billion now. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. but and I world, suspect that number is going to have to be adjusted. Yeah, worldwide. I mean, you yeah. and I were talking about COVID in, in January and February of what was happening to many of, of, of your, uh, your friends and colleagues in China, and they weren't even allowed to leave the house. Right. 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 So worldwide, that's the case. I mean, places like India, they were alerted that they had uh, three hours and then they had to live in their house for weeks and months. Yeah. Um, starvation happened far more in places like India where they were not even allowed to leave their house. And if you can't look far away because your house is pretty small, it's hard to not develop myopia. We know that from the submarine studies, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Worldwide. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm afraid uh, that we both agree that we're in for a rough ride here. Yeah. Um, okay, here's, here's a good I love this one. It says, what accommodation test do I need to do in the kids? I really don't remember anything except NRA, PRA. <laughs> yeah, that's I it. I can identify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here's the scoop is um, I, speaking with incredible amount of authority that my wife has on this topic, uh, <laughs> who is a pediatric optometrist. Um, you know, quick story here. All these stories take a long time, but quick story is, we had uh, patients coming in who were, do, who, who were myopic that were seeing my associate and they were being recommended vision therapy and they weren't getting into my ortho -K practice and I was mad as could be. And I'm like, what are you doing vision therapy for these patients on? And so uh, when we got a vision therapy resident and my resident, they got together and they're like, hey, yeah, you, you guys are in two different worlds here in your practice. You need to come together. And so we came to this realization that, in fact, if there is an accommodative problem, then the patient may not have that peripheral to focus. They may not even be myopic, right? They may be, they may be a hyperope that is an accommodative spasm that is making them myopic, which is really not the case. If we correct them with orthokeratology for their myopia and their accommodative issue is still there, that will drive their myopia to become worse. And so here's the things that I would recommend that you do with regards to a screener and some things that you will be able to identify. Number one is, and this isn't the order that you do them, but number one is if your cycloplegic refraction is more than a half or three quarters of a diopter from your refractive correction, uncycloplegic, put up a yellow flag. Number two is look at your NRA and your PRA. And really you want those to be over two and certainly over three for the PRA. And then the big one is the binocular cross cylinder, right? That's the little hash marks. That's the at symbol that we have. And then we throw in the plus minus 50 little markers on our ferropter, plus the patient up, and then start bringing them down. And if they're not accepting very much plus, that's a signal that the patient does not like, you know, plus at all in their refraction. And they probably have some accommodative issues. 
So if you do binocular vision in your practice, then there's some things that you can do for vision therapy to help those patients, which is by far the biggest recommendation I would give for you is get them into vision therapy. Um, if all of those things are normal, which is what we do in every single one of our myopia management uh, assessments, if all of those things are normal, then move forward with myopia management as we discussed tonight. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest changes I've seen in mainland China over the eight or 10 years that I've been going there and seeing children in various hospitals is they have also caught on that vision therapy and vision training is an integral part of myopia management. Yeah, These two have to go together. You have to rule yeah. one out. And so now it's almost, it's in every hospital as a complimentary or screen out kind of, uh, of therapy. So yeah. And it's not you. a hard thing to treat in yeah. therapy. It's not a hard thing to treat. It's not one of these nine months, 12 month therapy things. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so here's, uh, uh, this question, you know, whenever you talk about myopia as a disease, somebody asked this question said, okay, so are you saying that myopia is no longer just a refractive error that we need to think of it as a disease. So you know what's coming. So is presbyopia a disease? Yeah, uh, no, it's not um, as much as we want to say that it is. So here's the scoop, my friends, is when we say this, obviously myopia itself is a refractive condition, right? But having high amounts of myopia lead your risk factors to develop disease. Having presbyopia doesn't give you a greater risk of disease, at least in most of the studies that are out there. But by having a diopter of myopia puts you at a 40 times, 40% 40 greater risk of developing myopic maculopathy than if you're plano. So for that reason, it drives us towards progressive disease. And so that's why we are, you know, throwing around and saying myopia is a disease. Okay, let's see here. For a patient who isn't going to go with any kind of contact, say they're going to go eyeglasses, they're scared of lenses for whatever reason. When should you recommend a progressive or a bifocal for myopia control? You talked a little bit about the, you got to know which designs, you know, it used to be they all have to be executives. Uh, now, you know, since in the U.S., we don't have the dims or the, uh, the alternating kind of, so we, that's not an option for us. So do we even bother to put them in a bifocal of any kind if they, <clears throat> yeah. if they say no lenses yet? Yeah, so the best, the, the better thing to do in those cases would be to be, to put the patient in atropine. So that would be the thing that you would want to do that will be more successful, according to the studies, than any spectacle lens for any type of uh, patient who would benefit from them. Mm. The patients that tend to, um, you know, one other thing in the binocular thing that I didn't mention, uh, Jane, is if the child has an esophoric posture. And if they have an esophoric posture, that could be driving the accommodation as well. And so that's one of the other things that we're looking for. So if you have a patient who has an esophoria as well as has accommodative issues, and you want to just slap a Band-Aid on it and not do anything about it, that's when a progressive or a bifocal lens may be more successful, maybe more successful. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, you would uh, prescribe, um, you know, prism in addition to the bifocal ad to try to help that patient. Um, but, uh, you know, really you need to do vision therapy, but that, that's going to be your band-aid for that accommodative person. Putting a yeah, patient person needing a, a peripheral to focus into a bifocal is probably going to fall into that 3% improvement, which isn't very much. So right. atropine is really your best bet if the accommodation is normal. Yeah, I often, if I had a parent that for whatever reason would just, you know, that resistant, that would be somebody that we'd give them those glasses and ask them to come back in six months. And in six months, if that prescription is jumped, we'd say, well, there we go. This is what we discussed, you know. So it sometimes takes proving the parent 
with the idea that you really know what you're talking about, that this mm -hmm. pair of glasses is not going to do it. You know, so yeah. there's a lot of different communication styles to get into that. Yeah, you know, Jane, um, this is going to be a very extreme comment, oh. but I'm going to throw it out there. If you, you had a patient who wouldn't follow your recommendations for glaucoma, you'd probably let them know that there may be some other people who could recommend a better treatment for them than you could. Mm. It may be that at some point we're going to need to do that with people who won't take our recommendations and just say, hey, the risk factors are so high, I'm not comfortable continuing to be your provider. Uh, and uh, that's really extreme. That's pretty you know, extreme. and our patients are the ones who are the ones that are in control of their care. But at some point, you may start thinking about myopia the same way you think about macular degeneration risk factors and glaucoma and not be comfortable with people not taking your recommendation. Yeah, yeah. Since we're kind of on the practice management topic with your extreme comment there, yeah. uh, we did have one person said, please remind everyone tonight, you need to charge appropriately for myopia management therapy. You know, yeah. you're not, it's not your normal multifocal fit fee. You're not going to bill your vision care plans. It, you've had, you've, you've taken on extra training, just like tonight. Yeah. You spend extra time and your time, you should value that and expect to be paid appropriately, this person. Yeah. yeah, one of the worst things that we can have happen is have myopia management all of a sudden, um, you know, be watered down because of the complexity of it. And as soon as it becomes watered down and becomes less complex in all of our eyes who've gone through a special training for it, is uh, it, it, it's probably going to become less effective because people aren't going to spend the time that needs to be done in order to get it right. Uh, and so I, you know, very much agree with you. Uh, so many practitioners, a prime example of what I just said is so many practitioners charge so little for presbyopic contact lens fitting that they just don't do it anymore. You know, the vast majority of people that I hear say, oh, that doesn't work. Well, the reason it doesn't work is because you don't put the time into getting it right for your patient and finding the right specialty and the right lens for that patient. And so as such, you stop doing it because you're not charging appropriately. And if orthokeratology and myopia management, soft multifocals and atropine are seen as, well, you know, it's pretty easy to do, or, you know, it's not that big of a deal, so I'm not going to charge appropriately. Well, I, I, I reference back to the story of the, the mechanic who told the, the boat builder that he was going to charge a million dollars to fix his boat walked around the boat and took a hammer and smacked it and fixed the boat. And they had spent years trying to fix this boat. And they're like, we're paying a million dollars for you to use a hammer. He's like, no, no, that was free. Knowing where to hit with the hammer was the knowledge, right? right. Yep. Your correction with atropine, your correction with ortho -K, your correction with soft multifocals is really the expertise is what you know how to do and then you're using the tools. So even if it becomes more simplified for you, which I hope over time it will, um, it's really the expertise and the benefit you're bringing. So yes, we absolutely need to be uh, placing appropriate charges on there. And Jane, I'll just say for that, um, not to be self-serving in this, but we're working on putting together some, some guidelines and some practice recommendations for you. Euclid's doing the same thing. So if, if you wanna be involved in that launch, once it kind of comes out, you're welcome to, to email me. Um, you know, when Euclid has some of those things, I know that, that you know, Jane will make sure all of you are aware of them, but if it's something where I could help you with over time, feel free to email me and I can uh, get you some recommendations on getting started on the practice management side for your practice. Yeah, there, there is no doubt, you know, we, we all focus on the clinical pieces, you know, we need to learn. But we need to learn the different treatments, the different designs. And then the biggest part of myopia management, I believe, is we have to learn a whole different set of parent communication skills. Right. Because yeah. dealing with parents and dealing with children are not something 
that we inherently have training in. So yeah. uh, you that's Absolutely. a big package to take on. And and it's going to take chair time and it's going to take your education. So I agree. Yeah. I got a Absolutely. couple more questions. I don't want to eat up too much sure. of everybody's time. Sure. Um, OK, so how do you how, how do you do combination treatment with atropine and ortho K? Do you tell them wear the lens at night and put atropine on top of it? Do you? Uh, yeah, so we recommend the drop of atropine um, before putting the lens in. And so my recommendation is usually something like put the drop of atropine in, brush the teeth, put the lenses in. Yeah, yeah. And especially if there's any kind of preservative, you, you definitely want that to wash free of the eye. Um, yeah. Somebody said, um, talk to me about axial length. Do you believe orthokeratology has an impact on axial length growth? Yeah. Yep. Well, the studies show that it does. So there's several studies that are out there that show that we can slow down the progression, both refractive error, but also the axial length. And so for that reason, because of the studies that are out there, yes. You know, axial length discussions come into play all the time with orthokeratology and myopia management. And uh, do are you required to have one in order to do ortho K and uh, and myopia management? And and I say no, uh, just because there isn't a, a super reasonably cost a reasonable cost device that is out there. So I'd rather spend the money on a good topographer for which I'm going to use for a lot of other things. Um, and if I see refractive error changes or if I see corneal changes, then I'm going to consider. Uh, modifying things. Uh, but the vast majority of us who should be doing myopia management are not likely to buy these more expensive devices that are out there. And there's some that are out there. I could give you some recommendations of some good devices uh, that are out there, but I'd rather spend my money on a good topographer uh, that is going to help me with um, you know, all other aspects of my contact lens business than just an axial length measuring device. Yeah, I've got one question here and they're asking if they got it right and they don't. So I'm, let's straighten this out. Yeah. It says, uh, did you say a smaller optic zone for adults and a bigger one for children? Right. And right. I'm going to so say that. the so, other way around. <laughs> yeah. So the smaller treatment zone is going to yield a, a bigger delta between the most treatment area and the least treatment area, yielding a larger add. A large treatment zone is gonna get into the area of the pupil and you're just gonna have the refractive correction uh, that is gonna be going to the retina. There's not going to be this peripheral defocus. So a larger treatment zone for adults, a smaller treatment zone for, uh, you know, for, for children. And again, I'm going to mention, you know, my emails on the screen. Now, if you uh, aren't sure about how you're using your topography, I know uh, Jen Harthen is a, an incredible friend of mine, uh, did a webinar with, uh, with Euclid not too long ago. Um, if you're looking for tips on topographer or topographies or anything, feel free to email me about that. I know there's a couple questions about what topographies to use and so forth. Um, so if any of those type of questions come in, feel free to email me and I'll, you know we can help with that. And, and then there's also that webinar that uh, Jen was a part of. Yeah, yeah. I'm skipping through all of these questions because I know people have to, what's the age of the youngest patient you've ever done ortho K on? That's a good one. Yeah, so uh, I don't know, four, five, or six, uh, somewhere in there. I know we've done myopia management on, you know, four-year-olds right now. We've got a, uh, I think, a, a two- or three-year-old who we're doing atropine on. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those, those, it's far easier to do ortho-K on a three-year-old than it is to do on a five-year-old. Uh, just because they tend to have an opinion. Um, it gets worse by the time they get 15, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the difficult part of that is getting consistent good quality K measurements, True. you know, but, but over in China, as, as Jane, you know, there's, there's, there's babies that are treated with orthokeratology. I don't know that I agree with that, but that it's- been Well, 
Yeah, and I have to tell you officially, the Chinese government says eight years of age, no younger. However, we all know in hospital settings, there's quite a variation depending um, uh, internationally. You know, uh, a couple of quick, I'm gonna go back to, I had a question here from somebody who I believe is out of the country. Yes, in Nigeria and said he doesn't have atropine, of course, but he has a six-year-old patient Right eye is Plano and left eye is already a minus 10. Yeah. We may have, um, we may have something worse going on there, I might think. Yeah, probably yeah. some sort of, uh, yeah. I mean, th those things happen, right? I mean, we see that do. physiologically that that just happens. Sometimes there's yeah. things that have developed, you know, in utero or during birth or a trauma or something that caused that. But you know, you of course as the practitioner know far more about that than we do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have seen children fit which with one eye only and, and they do quite well, but yeah, I'd be suspicious there was other um, problems other than just traditional myopia there. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about your dosage of my, um, I'm going to, I'm just going to say this and they'll understand. Sala, you ask about support for research. Uh, my email will come up at the end. Contact me directly if you have questions about that. Yes, we do support research. But any tips on coding and billing for a six month follow up visit on a myopic patient? Yeah, yeah. So what I do is I use this machine. Um, and I show it to my patients and they slide their credit card through it. <laughs> And uh, that's the coding machine that we use. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, with, uh, with a patient who is not currently doing a myopia management program in our practice, then we do a, a private pay office visit for that type of encounter. And, uh, you know, we have a fee designated for that. If somebody's involved in a myopia management program that we have for them, we tend to have what's called an, an annual agreement and it covers them for any visit that they have throughout the year. And so they're able to come in and see us, you know, 15 times if they want to. No, no, nobody's ever done that or taken advantage of that. Uh, but we do that six month visit included in the cost yeah. of that. And we recommend it, you know, if somebody's uh, doing um, doing a soft multifocal lens, we only prescribe them six months of lenses uh, if they're a new wearer, and then recheck everything at six months. And if they're an ortho K wearer, we, you know we want to check to see if we need to make any modifications, and usually we don't. Um, and if it's just a small modification, then you know we'll we'll, we'll maybe push them off towards a year. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the question was talking about what code do you use? Do you use a nine two? What is it? Nine two three one two. As yeah. best I remember, when I left the practice, I got paid about fifteen dollars a visit for that. So my answer is no. <laughs> don't don't use those kind of code. I agree with you. This is something that takes extra training. It takes extra chair time, and it's like going to the orthodontist. Uh, you know your dental insurance isn't going to pay for all the orthodontia. You're going to pay for it out. Parents need yeah. to be prepared. They can use flex spending accounts. They can use healthcare accounts. But if you prepare them and they see it coming, they'll make the finances work. Yeah. But it's That's true. not going to in, bill them an edge, uh, a basic. In the technical basic. sense, the, the, the code that, that you may want to use, and I'd recommend that you do this based upon uh, you know, you looking into this, I, I, I don't, I'm not claiming to be a coding expert, but a, a 92014 is the comprehensive eye exam code that you tend to use for an eye exam. And insurance, like a vision plan, would cover that once a year. So if you then bill a 92012 or a 92014 code, uh, it would typically not be covered by insurance that additional time, even if that's the code you put in. And so then it would end up being a private pay encounter because insurance wouldn't cover it a second time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we have to get past that idea that insurance, uh, insurance is not our friend, you know, because you, you know, you can bill 
you can bill two hundred and fifty dollars for your annual comprehensive exam, but your insurance company is going to send you what's in your contract. And the patient thinks we get all of that, but we don't. We have to write it off. You all right. know that. So yeah. you don't want to like get into the insurance coverage if we yeah. can avoid it here at all. I, I thought everybody knew that a whole bunch of money got written off, but nope, no. Nope. <laughs> I, I started to say it was always staggering when we had to do that. Let's see. Oh, here's a great question because we're running out of time. I'm going to wrap it up here. Okay. Uh, you talked about two hours of outside time. Does it have to be in the sunlight? Or would it also, is there some benefit even if it's dark and they're out? You know, twilight or yeah, green well, lights. Yeah, well, here in the Pacific Northwest, we don't have uh, sunlight. <laughs> have bright, bright sunlight. <laughs> so, yeah, so so I, I can't speak with absolute authority on the answer to that question. But from my understanding, it's not so much that it's bright, bright sunlight as much as the other things that we get from being outside, uh, the receptors that are triggered when you are in uh, outside. I don't think being outside at night necessarily counts nearly the degree of when there is sunlight out there. Um, but, uh, you know, bright sunlight or even in the shade, uh, I believe is what the study looked at. And you're making me have to go back and read that study. But um, even in the shade, I think that there was um you know some improvement so yeah, yeah yeah i think the the phrase is natural sunlight mm -hmm. you know so that could be slightly overcast it could be shady it could be bright but i think there has to be a sunlight at, which you don't get at night you might get a bright mm -hmm. moonlight but i i don't think it was covered in the study okay this is our last one because i think it kind of pulls it all together in a nice bundle uh any of the rest of you i've got people with hands up i got all kinds of things please uh <laughs> You know, our emails are up there. Please uh, follow up with either one of us and we'll be we'll be glad to answer these uh, as many as you as you need. We're just going to run out of time here. This yeah. one says, how do you educate? Um, how do you educate parents on myopia in the practice? Do you uh, you do outreach programs? Do you use some kind of in office tools? Or do you just wait till the kid bring the kid on in for an exam and then have that conversation or all of the above? I don't know. Yeah, David, that's a great question. And you know, uh, we we might need to do the next webinar on that very thing. But uh, key and Jane on that, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, so there's great things to do. Number one is you, you, many of us can grow our myopia management from within our own practice and don't even have to go outside the practice. And then the word of mouth really builds itself. So what that starts with is starting that conversation in the practice and just saying, you know, here's the deal is uh, we've recently learned or the research is now showing uh, that we can't keep doing glasses for your child. This is, this is new things. And by saying the research says, or we now have learned, that shows that you as the practitioner are on the cutting edge. And that now, if anybody else says anything different, they're obviously not skilled in the research and they're not knowing what's going on. So the research clearly says that. And then the conversation of doing orthokeratology, which is beyond the scope of this particular discussion. Um, and then out, outreach sort of things are a great thing to do. And you can do that as simply as running some reports within your practice. Uh, I, I actually just wrote this in an article that's going to be published in Contact Lens Spectrum this next month of, uh, of reaching out to five myopia patients that you have not seen in the last six months and reach out to them and just say, hey, I want you to get in because um, I'm starting to fit this new lens that has been shown to uh, help slow down the progression of nearsightedness. And I, I, you know, I thought of you, you were one of the first ones to do it. And under a pilot program for the first five or 10 patients that we're doing, we're doing it at a reduced cost and uh, reaching out to patients in that way. 
Um, and, uh, and, and that kind of can get some people in the door if you want to start right off with a bang doing a bunch of patients. So those are a couple of things. And, you know, I've got a dozen other ideas that I'd be happy to share with any of you. And we're, you know, like I said, we're putting together kind of some, some discussion points around this. So if you want to reach out to me for more, it's Dave at optometricinsights.com. And I'd be happy to talk with you more about it. Well, I want to, uh, to wrap up the evening one by saying certainly thank you to Dr. Kading for spending his time. So like I said, uh, I've known Dave for many years and I always learn something in our discussions. So uh, up on the screen is many of you are from outside of the US and we wanted to make sure you had the list of our distributors. I think the only one we recognized was missing was India. And, uh, and so I responded to that person or, and the emails, Laura, if you can drop our emails back up there, I wanna make sure everybody has Dr. Kading's email and my email. So please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, we'll be glad to point you in any direction if we don't have the answers for you. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll help you out as best we can. On behalf of everybody at Euclid Systems Corporation, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time. There's nothing more valuable than your time. And we appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, we'll be looking for emails as follow up to this and the announcement of the next in our 2021 webinar series. Thank you, everyone. Have a safe and good new year.